in the last lecture where I left off was I was talking of using thermal decomposition of solutes in solution for spray deposition of thin films like the zinc oxide or doped in oxides. An experimental setup is given in this slide which is available from YouTube is if you look very closely this is basically where an ultrasonic spray is a, a spray is being deposited is being sprayed on a hot plate. I drew it in an inverse fashion they are spraying it here for getting a thin film coating on the glass slides which are over there. Uh, at times what happens is this spray nozzle and the liquid that comes out that is a very important one. Uh, like say as I had drawn in the microstructure let us say this is the size of the initial droplet as it goes into the hotter zone the water evaporates shrinking it as this occurs by 100 150 degree centigrade by the time it has gone to 250 degree centigrade or so it has sh shrunk and at 400 degree centigrade plus other reactions take place. Here what I had in, enlarged it to show that at this particular place the water molecules in the initial droplet has evaporated and I have got crystals of zinc acetate over here. Above 400 degrees centigrade what happens is each of these crystals they dissociate each of them is in gas state. So, they would dissociate to give you ZNO plus CO2 plus H2O. So, about 400 degree centigrade I would get powders of zinc oxide over here with carbon dioxide and water going out. However, one of the problems that happen is anybody who has used a spray gun or has played with holy colors they would have seen that the droplets are not uniform. So, from the nebulizer I can have droplets this large I can have droplets this small I can have droplets this small and this varying size of droplets at the start create a major problem simply because when the droplet is large the residence time of that large droplet in the hot zone just to evaporate the water is longer than the residence time of the finer droplets in the hot zone because the water evaporates faster and as a result with varying droplet sizes what we are faced with is at this end I may have large clusters I may have fine clusters and as a result the ultimate size of the powder that is difficult to control. So, what people have developed is they have added an ultrasonic nozzle for atomization. So, what the ultrasonic nozzle does in order when the droplet is emerging from the nozzle the ultrasonic waves break it up into very microfine parts and what you will see here is this is an ultrasonic nozzle and these droplets are in the form of very fine mist. They are very very uniform and as a result 
the ultimately the particles that are being generated that are being deposited on the hot substrate they are almost of uniform size. Now one has to realize that these droplets are already in the form of mists that means sizes of the order of 10 20 microns or less and when they dissociate they generate powders which are 100 at times 50 nanometers. So, the powders from this spray process which reach the heated substrate are in the range of 50 to 100 nm. With a reasonably uniform size sintering of these powders which reach the heated hot plate is uniform and we can get an uniformly dense body. However, if the droplet size had varied, if the droplet sizes had varied giving powders very fine, large, fine, medium, all sizes, then the, the sintering rates would have been different and the density of the film would not have been uniform. As a due to this, in this hot plate, hot pyrolysis deposition system, the key issue is the nebulizer and achieving very fine droplets for the liquid that is coming out. The time of flight, the height of the heater, all those things can be controlled. But the key thing is what is the size of the initial droplet. This method as I said allows us one very, very important factor which is I can have single component for sure, double component yes, three component possible three ten films. Uh, I myself have grown thin films of lanthanum, calcium, manganate. using the type of setup which you saw on the screen by uh, basically spraying the liquid through a hot zone onto a hot surface. The advantage is this process is unlike where I will fail with the alkoxide based process. I could not get any alkoxide of lanthanum, calcium and manganese which would hydrolyze at the same time, at the same rate. And I use this particular method of spray pyrolysis to get this particular thin films. Conventionally though, today even today, the industry standard of thin film deposition is physical or chemical vapor deposition. In these processes, the thin films are generated not from solutions, but from the solids. Before I go into thin film deposition of ceramics, let me go through the different physical vapor deposition processes which are used by the industry. Now, let me take the case of a 
semiconductor. They are evaporating metals for contacts. They are evaporating semiconductors, maybe silicon itself or say a two component one gallium arsenide or a three component one Indian aluminum gallium arsenide, it was sorry it was a four component over there and they are also depositing high K dielectrics which are all ceramics to separate the layers. So, let us look let me go through the different equipment and their working principle which the semiconductor industry employs and out of that I will talk of what is used for say as I said high K dielectrics or ceramics. One of the simplest deposition process is thermal evaporation. Thermal evaporation you are seeing it all the time around you. It is today it is 48 degree centigrade out here I am sweating. The um, sweat is evaporating is depositing somewhere that is thermal evaporation. You um, let, let me stop there that is that is thermal evaporation. So, basically in this particular thermal evaporation what will I have is a source where I will place some material A which will be heated, it will melt and give a vapor. This vapor will be deposited on a substrate. This is the simplest description of thermal evaporation. We see it when the kettle boils, the moisture steam rises, if you put your hands in its path, the vapor will deposit on your hand giving a thin water layer. However, be it semiconductor industry or electronic ceramics, the very nature of crystal growth of the vapors that arise and deposit over here, this growth has to be uniform, it cannot be random. You see, there is this film can be grown if I will say epitaxially directionally oriented and random growth. I will not go into the difference between epitaxial and directionally oriented now, right at not at right this juncture, but maybe later. Here, the films are all oriented in one direction, every layer of the film is oriented in one direction. Whereas, in random, the films may grow very randomly in whatever direction they want. As a result, the mechanical and the electrical properties, the optical properties of this randomly grown film will be different 
from the epitaxial or the directionally oriented ground fell. Now, why are some films grown in a random fashion while some are grown in a very directionally oriented fashion? Now, the question is huge. It depends on what material. But let us say pick one material A. Under what condition can I have it directionally oriented? And in what condition can I have it randomly grown? Same material, same substrate, everything same. Only in one case, I want all of them grown like this paper. This paper, they are all oriented. And in some other case, I want it grown very, very randomly. This depends on how this vapor reaches the surface. All of you are aware of the mean free path concept that was taught to you right from class 9. So, there is no point in my talking of it anymore now. But let me draw three situations or two just to simplify matters. Let me draw two. Here is a stainless steel plate. Uh, with a port for vacuum electrical leads these are high current electrical leads to supply power to this resistive heater. Let us consider this scenario. Here, this is a stainless steel plate, vacuum port to evacuate it, and here is a bell jar which covers it. I have placed a crucible here which has got the material to be evaporated and uh, I have got a substrate. This is the substrate. This is the crucible and this is the heater. Let us say everything is at atmospheric pressure. I am just going to evaporate. Let us say this is gold. Ah, that's a good choice. Let us say this is gold because it won't oxidize. So, I take this crucible, put gold in it or it could be silver also, put it inside this closed vessel. I do not evacuate it. It is at atmospheric pressure and then I evaporate it, heat this gold. After some time, I will see a very thin coating of gold over here. That is situation 1. That is situation 1, no vacuum. <coughs> Let us take the situation 2. I have evacuated before heating, before heating to say 10 to the power of minus 3 tor. So, it is 1000th of an atmosphere. Under this condition, once the pressure here is 10 to the power of minus 3 tor and I have heated this filament for the same length of time as I did in air case, I will say 
that there is gold the gold coating here appears thicker a bit and more uniform. In this particular case, if I looked at the substrate, I would find very non uniform gold coating, maybe. But here, I find that the coating is uniform. Why does it happen? Mean free path. At 10 to the power of minus 3 tor, the mean free path is close to a centimeter. So, the vapor as it rises from here undergoes fewer collisions with the air present in the chamber when it is at 10 to the power of minus 3 tor. But in air, the vapor undergoes many more collisions. Frequently, this vapor falls back and hence in air I get a thinner coating than if I heat do it at 10 to the power of minus 3 tar. In both these cases, if I look at the films under a microscope, a scanning electron microscope, Say, what would I see? This is the microscope. This is how we standardly draw our micrographs. I would see in case 2, this is a whole gold particle. This is a composite. But if I magnify it, I will see within the gold particle, there are green boundaries. And within it, there are gold atoms, gold, gold which is oriented in different directions. This will be polycrystalline. This is because of the scattering that the gold vapors faced as it was deposited due to scattering with air molecules. If it was 1, in this case, the scanning electron microscope would show a much more thinner layer and a very fine polycrystalline sample. But as I said, if I wish to use, if I wish to get this sort of a film, you can call it epitaxial. I am merging three terms, epitaxial, directionally oriented, single crystalline. They are not, the three terms are not the same, I warn you. They are different, but for functionality sake, I have merged them because finally they mean this type of crystal structure, a perfectly oriented crystal structure, film structure. So, how do I get them? It is possible to get them if I evacuate it to say 10 to the power of minus 9 tor, where mean free path is greater than 0 0.5 meters. It means the vapor which arises from this, if I have reduced the vacuum to 10 to the minus tor, it would not collide with another molecule, another air molecule until it is at least this far, 18 inches far. So, at 10 to the minus 9 tor, a vapor which is coming out will possibly come into contact with an air molecule for collision only after it has crossed half a meter or 18 inches. So, if I have got 10 to the power of minus 9 tor and the distance between my source and the target 
is less than half a meter or 18 inches. So, let us say this what am I going to expect? What I am going to expect that as the vapor rises, it goes and hits the substrate straight without any zigzag, without losing any potential energy or kinetic energy. And it is this sort of a growth which helps us get epitaxial growth. This occurs at 10 to the power of minus 9 tor. So, whether we uh, whether if we require high quality growth which is epitaxial as demanded by the semiconductor industry, we have to work at 10 to the power of minus 9 tor or so to make sure that the vapors do not collide with the air molecules. Because even at 10 to the power of minus 9 tor, even though it is 10 to the power of minus 12th of an atmosphere, air is there and the slightest collision will cause loss of momentum. So, under thermal evaporation, we can have evaporation at 10 to the power of minus 3 tor where we get polycrystalline materials, polycrystalline films or evaporation at 10 to the power of minus 9 tor where we get perfectly oriented films for devices. In both the cases, we are all we are doing is we have a crucible and a heater. That's all. That's fundamentally th this. Now this heater design applies to thermal evaporation, where polycrystalline films are okay, like say electrical contacts. However, when we want epitaxial films as demanded by the ceramic by the electronic industry, the design of the heater changes. The he design is called a Knudsen cell. I leave it to you to Google the cell, this Knudsen cells image and look it up. All I will say is draw is a schematic to help you understand. The Knudsen cell, what is its purpose? It is going to be used at 10 to the power of minus 9 tor. Why? So that collisional deactivation of the vapors which come out with whatever air molecules are there are reduced to a minimum. So, that the vapor will leaves the Knudsen cell is striking the target without any loss of direction or momentum. So, the fundamental job of the Knudsen cell is its ability to send out vapors of the material as a parallel beam. Hence, the fundamental design of the Knudsen cell is different from the thermal evaporation equipment used at 10 to the minus 3 tor. A Knudsen cell will have an outer metallic container within which is a non-wetting boron nitride cell. To give you some idea of the dimension, if this is 
3.5 centimeters. This diameter of the outer container is 5 centimeter. The total height of the Knudsen's cell, this active heating area shall be about 20 centimeters. The material which is to be evaporated will occupy this space. This is the heating zone. Please see where I am drawing the heaters. Right from top to bottom. Why? The heating has to be totally uniform so that the vapors which leave the nudes and which leave the solid please understand this is still well inside the nudes and cell the temperature here is the same as temperature here this ensures that the vapors have same momentum direction this is the nudes and cell which is used at 10 to the power of minus 9 tor for making epitaxial films. The vapors live are parallel, there are other things and you can look up nudes and cells in the or you can google it and look up the image of nudes and cell and how it works. But what I want you to remember is both of these the crude thermal evaporator or the nudes and cell they are basically the same, they are thermal evaporation systems for working at different specifications. This thermal evaporator, the simple one is used even in small gold shops where they are now gold plating or metal plating your ornaments. This nude sense cell is at the top end of the semiconductor fab line and uh, they are both thermal evaporators. So, you have to understand the technology is a dual use technology and you have to work on it. Let me go over here and see I would not spend much time on this. Uh, yep. As you see, these are two electrical leads over here. Okay, let me expand it. Two electrical leads over here, which are the resistive heaters and the substrate is placed over here the substrate can be heated and this is the bell jar so this bell jar is placed on top of the stainless steel plate this material will be evacuated let me skip this machine part and go to what matters yes ah Here the electrical leads are getting heated up, it is being deposited, thermal evaporation is over and let us see what happens when they take it out. Let them take it out and we will see what coat, what type of coating has worked. Yep, that is what has been coated. This is a simple thermal evaporation for low melting materials. Now, other than thermal evaporation, you see thermal evaporators as I said 
you take the heating element, put the material into a crucible. You have to melt it. At times, we are faced with the situation that the melting point is very high. You do not have a crucible in which to hold the melt as the melting point is higher than the melting point of the crucible. The thermal evaporators, the resistive wires also have a limit. The wire platinum, at times we have used platinum in desperation as a heater. For example, in Knudsen cell, the heating element is platinum wire because it melts at 1750 degrees centigrade. So, I can use a platinum wire to heat the nude cell up to 1700 degrees centigrade. And platinum is very expensive. So, in many cases, thermal evaporation, even of metals, and certainly with ceramics, which are much more higher melting, does not work. What is then done is what is called, we have to find out how can we do it. And the process used is DC sputtering. It is nothing, very easy. Your tube light works on this principle. How does your tube light work? At the tube light, there are small thermonic emitters. When you switch it on, they emit electrons and then they are accelerated. There is a potential gap between the two ends. As the electrons go, they ionize the gas. The, the, as the electrons, the argon, fast moving electrons, they ionize the argon to give argon plus, plus electron, plus the original electron. This they recombine to give you argon plus light. This is how your tube lights work. This is sputtering is based on this principle. Let us see how it works or it does not work and let us take it from there. For this is sputtering, I would again take that bell jar is a very simple example. This is the stainless steel base plate. I have got an inverted bell jar on top of it. This is the vacuum port. I have got the material which I want to evap deposit. This is the cathode. This is the substrate. Or called anode. Without doing anything, let us first evacuate it. Let us evacuate it to say 10 to the power of minus 5 tor or 10 to the power of minus 8th of an atmosphere and apply a potential. We are not doing anything. There is a simple high voltage between the cathode and the anode. Now, if through a leak we introduce argon, what will happen? The argon gas will come in. Now, please understand even as I am leaking argon, my pressure is 10 to the bar of minus 5 tor. I am not breaking vacuum. 
So, the amount of argon which is being leaked is less than 0.1 SCM per minute. A very small amount of argon is being leaked in to into this vacuum chamber where there is let us say 10 kV. Let us be if I want to make it good, let me make it good 10 kV. So, what happens? It is now argon has gone in. This argon will be struck by this electrons and as a result the electrons will strike the argon and I will get argon ions plus 2 electrons. Where will this argon ion go? This argon ion will come and strike this electrode. The kinetic energy will be transferred to potential energy and this electrode material will be knocked off. During this, this is basically what is DC sputtering. In DC sputtering, we take a chamber, vacuum chamber, put the substrate and the target in, evacuate to set to the power of minus 5 tor, bleed argon gas in, of course the potential has been applied and what happens is a plasma occurs over here and uh, the argon gas strikes it, the target material is ablated. You see from one electron I have got two electrons. So, all the more amounts of electrons are multiplying and as a result I am having larger and larger number of argon ions being generated. These argon ions are being neutralized at the cathode. The strike, the potential velocity with which the argon ion strikes causes ablation from the surface which now gets deposited on the su substrate. This is the simplest DC sputtering. Using this method, many metals have been deposited over time. What do you see over here? Sputtering process, this is the target. Over the target, we have this plasma. The argon ions are going and hitting the target and ablating the materials which deposit on this substrate material. This is how basically DC sputtering works. However, this is a course on ceramics, not on how metals are deposited. One of the biggest problems when we want to deposit a ceramic thin film using DC sputtering is look at over here. I very con conveniently said that the argon atoms come here, they strike the cathode, this is negatively charged, the argon ion loses its charge. How convenient. I am a superb glib teacher. I did not say that hey, this is a ceramic. If it is a ceramic, it is an insulator and there is no way will neutralization occur. So, in a if I, when I am using ceramic substrates, one of the problems that occur is positive charge builds up right on the cathode. Oh, this has become too unclean. So, here if I replace it, this will be cathode. If this is a ceramic target and the cathode as 
more and more argonians come and strike argon argonians 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 what is going to happen after some time there will be a positive charge build up and the argonians can no longer hit the cathode so this this is sputtering which i conveniently described showed you a great 30 second clip on the plasma is of no use to a ceramist until and unless he can remove this positive charge sheath which forms as puttering progresses. So, what is the only alternative? How can he do it? One way of doing it is if between the cathode and the anode an RF bias is imposed so that the cathode at times becomes negative, at times becomes positive, switches and this is done by radio frequency. 13.56 megahertz is the industry standard. This RF bias, only a very small voltage, is imposed between these two. So that the polarity switches, this positive charge buildup on the target is avoided and argon ions can keep on hitting it. So now we have DC sputtering and I have now coupled radio frequency imposition between the anode and the cathode to ensure positive charge buildup does not occur on the target surface because it is an insulator and a ceramic. But in real life, would I really, really get enough deposition if I am using a ceramic target, using RF and DC sputtering? Honestly, answer is no. The char energy is not sufficient. So, how on earth would I use this physical vapor deposition technique to deposit a ceramic thin film? Let us look at the ways. Basically, what I have in sputtering is anode, I have got the cathode, I have got the plasma and the electrons, the gas atoms are striking, and the material is ablating. My problem is unlike metals ceramics are very hard they are high melting and as a result even if we use rf plus dc sputtering the yield the amount of thin film generated using dc plus rf is very small now let me do a funny thing What have I done? What have I done is something a bit interesting. The target is there. It is placed on the cathode. But then, if this is the cathode on which I will keep my target, what I have done is I have drilled a hole is <coughs> I drilled a spherical path on which I placed a magnet, is spherical magnet. So this is a magnet. This is a magnet. That's the thing that I've done. In RF, this is sputtering. 
it is just a cathode with a target my yield is low <coughs> here i am going to what i've done is placed a magnet below the target to increase the yield any idea why this is called magnetron sputtering because it is called magnetron so it is called magnetron sputtering look at the diagram very carefully ha huh. this is the magnets are here that's the electron roaming about that's the magnetic field it is bound by it here comes the argon ion the argon ion is struck by the electron the argon ion knocks loses it and the material is deposited so what you see is one argon atom is being ionized repeatedly and what i get is basically a thin film i'll go back to it again so i have got this electron now it has got into the magnetic field the argon ion will now come in it will be struck by the electron two more electrons are generated the argon ion now hits the target becomes argon atom and ablation is going on but what was gained by this magnetron process if you had noticed and if you remember the left hand and the right hand rules there is an electric field in one direction magnetic field in the other so what was happening in that slide which i am sure nobody had noticed very carefully is this that the electron once it gets into the magnetic field it will go in a circular orbit ah it is now the electro electron is going in a helical circular orbit around the electrical magnetic field and it is picking up a vast amount of energy so the very thing that this electron is doing is because it's in that magnetic field in the presence of electric field it is generating a is going around it many times in a helical form and as a result the energy available for it to ionize the argon ion is much more and so the yield is also high when i come back i shall continue with this rf magnetron sputtering of ceramic thin films thank you